Nick, I don't think you were here last night, were you? Or maybe I wasn't looking right. <laughs> you don't have to. You, you missed the perfect attendance, though. There's a little prize for perfect attendance. But I think you're over the age limit anyway. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. We are uh, second evening into a study on Matthew chapter 6, his kingdom first, putting God's kingdom first. And John Glick is going to be sharing with us on prayer and fasting the next couple evenings. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, let's just bow our heads for a word, of a, a word of prayer, and then, John, you can come forward. God, I thank you for your word and the, the power in your word, the power to, to speak into our lives and the, the truth that we can bank on. And God, I pray that you would be with John as he shares this evening. I just ask God that your spirit would guide him as he opens this passage and as we look at it together. And God, that we could not just hear, but put it to practice, be like the wise man and, and obey what we um, understand from your word and continue. God, help us to continue to um, encourage each other, spur each other on to love and good works and service in your kingdom. Just thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, just one other announcement. We are lifting an offering. If you weren't here last night, the offering goes for, um, I can't remember the name of the organization, but it's uh, based out of Romania for um, outreach work, refugee work, helping people coming from Ukraine and, and work in Ukraine. The same organization that we had lifted an offering for several months ago. So that'll be kind of in the middle of, uh, of, of John's session, so you can be prepared for that. God bless you, John. Good evening. As you heard, my assignment is uh, taken out of Matthew 6 on prayer and fasting. I have attempted to put a few things on PowerPoint here to sort of help us help guide us through this. Uh, <clears throat> so this evening I'll be, I'll be looking especially at uh, prayer, and then hopefully tomorrow evening we'll get into uh, uh, the second part of that. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to be asking for a volunteer to read verses 5 through 15. So as soon as you have it and someone wants to volunteer, please make yourself known. Curtis, would you stand and read that? And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your heavenly Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. After this manner therefore pray, our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Thank you. Of course, the subject of prayer is a large one. We could go different directions with this. I've attempted to 
focus on uh, what the text, the words of Jesus here, address on the subject of prayer, at least uh, to some extent. I'll be branching out some. But uh, let's think a little bit. And by the way, I, inv I invite your participation. Uh, I'm not the best at, thank you, I'm not the best at getting the class to talk. So if you have something to say, just raise your hand or make yourself known. Uh, this is, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it has been called, I think, uh, Laws of the Kingdom, or maybe we could say Bylaws for Kingdom Living, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, who was Jesus speaking to? His disciples, yes. And I think it was more than the twelve. It tells us there in chapter 5, first verse, that the disciples came unto him. I think there were more than the 12 at this point. There were probably, well, I don't know how many. And then the multitude was there. It's quite possible that the multitude also heard Jesus teaching. Uh, and the mountain, I don't think, was actually a, a big high mountain. It was a long slope there is what they tell us or, where Jesus was speaking from. But he was speaking mainly to, yes, the disciples. And so we accept this as being for us, don't we? So he saw important that part of these bylaws for kingdom living are about prayer and fasting. Martin Luther said this way, to be a Christian, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. We say sometimes that prayer is the vital breath of the Christian, and I, indeed I believe it is. I believe if we're here this evening as Christians, we know what it is to pray to God. <clears throat> Someone else said, prayer should not be regarded as a duty which must be performed, but rather as a privilege to be enjoyed. And so I hope in this, these couple evenings as we look at this subject of prayer, and fasting, which goes along with prayer. I just hope we can be encouraged to have a, even a more meaningful prayer life. I trust we know what it is to pray and to, to enjoy our prayer life. I hope we do. But I hope we can be uh, inspired to, to make it even more meaningful. I, I really believe, and I, I say this for myself, I believe there are uh, dimensions of fellowship with God that that I haven't reached yet. And, and probably that's true for all of us. There, there's yet a deeper relationship and fellowship available for us. And so I hope we can be encouraged to, uh, to pursue that, even a deeper relationship with God. <clears throat> Someone said, too, man is never greater than when he is in communion with God. So I have, uh, I'm just going to go quickly through a few points here that I'd, I'm hoping to address this evening. I'm not sure how far we'll get, but uh, just to uh, make you aware of what we're looking at. Uh, can you see that? I want to look at prayer as a relationship with the Father. And we see here in... Uh, well, Jesus said in verse 6, he said, you, you, you are to pray to the Father. Now, it occurred to me, maybe you have some input on this. What, was this something new, do you think, to the disciples, to address God as Father? Do we find that in the Old Testament? Or no. Sam says no. I think that's probably true. I didn't do a lot of research on it, but I looked a little bit in the concordance and and then I looked at the Psalms, you know, David addresses him as Lord over and over again, Jehovah or God. But I think it possibly was a new concept to the disciples to address God as Father. Anybody have any more input on that? Or any, any more light on that? <clears throat> Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They said Abraham is our father. <laughs> but uh, as far as, yeah, Jesus is speaking here about yeah, relationship 
with God as Father. <clears throat> and then uh, we'll look at wrong motives for prayer. Uh, Jesus addressed that here, some wrong uh, motives that the Pharisees had, and I'd like to enlarge on that a little and think about how we maybe sometimes can have wrong motives. Rewards for prayer. Jesus said that uh, the Father will reward you openly. So think about that a little. I might ask for your input on that. How does God reward us for prayer? I have some thoughts on that, but uh, I'm not sure that, uh, that I'm really on target with all that. <clears throat> and then uh, manner of prayer. Jesus said here, after this manner, therefore pray ye. And I don't uh, plan to enlarge on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Manny did a good job of that in a couple messages here recently. Uh, if we get that far, I'd just like to look at some types of prayer, some of which are found here in the Lord's Prayer uh, or the model prayer. Uh, not all of them. Some are found elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, so we'll see if we get that far tonight. <clears throat> So I've, uh, I'd like to start here then on a relationship with the Father and some points on that. Uh, how, do you how do you establish a relationship? Communication. Pardon? Communication. Communication, yeah. Interest in time. Takes time. Well, you men... Uh, when you started dating your wife-to-be, uh, what, what were you aiming for? <laughs> Probably to build a relationship, right? To pursue a relationship with her. But yeah, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes communication. <clears throat> so, a relationship, establishing a relationship with the Father. How's it done? <clears throat> And I have a few points here. I don't, uh, I don't you, you might have some other ideas, but <clears throat> would someone read John 16, verses 23 and 24? Could someone find that, please? Dave, would you find that and, and read it? John 16, what? 16, verses 23 and 24. In the name of Jesus, go ahead and read that. And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto, having ye asked nothing in my name, ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Okay, yeah, and I think we find that some other places too. Jesus said now, uh, okay, God, you, you're to pray to God as your Father. You're to ask in, in my name, in the name of Jesus. What does that mean, to pray in the name of Jesus? What does it mean to you? He's our mediator. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we, at the end of our prayers, we often say, in Jesus' name or in the name of Christ. And I think that's good. I'm not saying we always have to, but I think it's good to remind us that we are indeed praying in Jesus' name. But I think there's much more to it than that. Just tacking those words onto the end of our prayer does not uh, necessarily mean that we are praying in the name of Jesus. I'm putting this here first because I think we, the only way we can come to God is through Jesus, right? You know, in the Old Testament, God lived in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, in the temple, and people did not dare to go in there. But then when Jesus was crucified, hanging on the cross, that veil was rent in two, and now the way is open to the presence of God. And the only way we can come into God's presence is through Jesus Christ. As we apply his blood to our, to our hearts to wash away our sins, as we claim him by faith as our Lord and Savior. So that's why I'm putting this first here. If we want to have a relationship with this Father, it must be through Jesus we must have had that experience of having our sins washed away and continue to have the experience of claiming the blood for the remission of our sins. 
I think it would include being under his lordship, having Jesus as Lord. How does that work? If we don't come in the name of Jesus, I'm just thinking of someone that don't have a relationship with Jesus and they are praying, it just goes up receiving that's as far as it goes. You know, okay. is it, does God not hear unless you come through Jesus? Uh, what is the prayer of a sinner that God hears or heeds to? And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. and believe in thine heart that thou art raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Right. So, in the Old Testament, there's a verse in the book of Isaiah, I think, that God doesn't hear the sinner's mm -hmm. prayer just to God without confession. Until it's that prayer of repentance, right? Does that answer your question, Dave? So that's really the point I'm trying to make here, that, yes, we must come through Christ. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's the way we establish a relationship with our Father. Someone even said, go ahead. I was in a setting recently where the person praying was clearly addressing the Holy Spirit rather than God or Jesus. I was a little uncomfortable with that. What would you say to that? Any thoughts on that? It does say that the spirit does not, how does that, speak of himself. I'm not sure if that's the verse I want. So much a spirit glorifies Christ, right? The spirit does not draw attention to himself, but he. Now, we do sing songs sometimes. <laughs> well, we, spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. The Bible speaks about communion with the Holy Spirit and fellowship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Right. I think that says it well. Now, I hear people praying to Jesus, too, and I don't want to say that's wrong, but, but yeah, I think the pattern, that's the pattern that Jesus gave, right? Right. Okay. We, uh, some of us may remember this. If we had a, a, a dear brother, and he's gone now to be with the Lord, but there, in fact, he didn't think we should sing in the Holy Spirit, sing any song of the Spirit. Yeah, I remember I, that. I would disagree because in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Right. Mm -hmm. And that spirit of the living God, I like that song. It, somehow it feels right to be asking the spirit to be upon us. Okay. Uh, well, the next one I have here. Okay, someone. So I, I think the I think the Spirit is is making a continual intercession for us, really. One other thing that this might be a little bit of a technicality, but I often hear. I mean, it, I used to do it myself. I think maybe sometimes I still do. But we say, "In your name, I pray." Amen. Mm -hmm. I think I agree with you that on, I think I agree with you on that, Tim, but uh, yeah, but on the other hand, we don't want to be too uh, picky and uh, critical, <laughs> but yeah, I think we need, it's right to talk about these things, yeah. Okay, the next point I have here is uh, an open line of communication. Do, do, you, do you know what it feels like to, when, when it feels like you're just not getting through to God? I know how I live with my phone. If I take 897, heading through Shiva Maple, 
I'm, I'm connected, and then all of a sudden I'm disconnected. Right. I like I think we know what it's like to want to call somebody and the line is busy or get their voicemail. I have that a lot with my Amish clients. I get their voicemail and I, sometimes I want to, you know, I, I really should talk with them, but I can't get through. Or I remember well, back when I was a boy, we had party lines. How many remember party lines? Oh, quite a few. I remember we, we were Amish, but we had a phone out in the phone shanty by the road there, and we were on a party line. And so my dad would want to make a phone call, something about the farm, you know, about business. And there was this lady lived somewhere in the neighborhood, and she'd be fussing away. And so he'd wait and go back 20 minutes later. She'd still be talking. And, and it was frustrating, you know. But if we can't get through to God, if we don't seem to be getting through to God, who's, whose fault is it? It's ours, yeah. Certainly not God's, because God's line is always open. Right. So if it does seem... To, okay, does Jesus say anything here that... Give us, does he give, give us any guidelines here or any instructions on what might help us to get through to God? What does he say in verse uh, 6 that we should do? In secret, shut the door, enter thy closet, and shut thy door. Now, I think that can certainly be applied just like it says. I think there's, we should have a place where we can get alone with God and shut the door, literally. And, but uh, there might be more involved in shutting the door. It's possible that we could be in a room by ourselves and not really have the door shut. You think it is? Right. Mm -hmm. Or if our phone has a habit of ringing during our prayer time, maybe we'd be better off turning it off or letting it elsewhere. Or if there's a computer screen in front of us that tends to distract us, we'd better put it elsewhere or close it or something. I think there's, just because we're alone with God, uh, I mean, you know, alone in a room, does not necessarily mean that the door is shut. So I think there's a, a lot in this that Jesus was saying here. If we, want, if we want to get through to God, we have to shut the door. Anything more on that? <clears throat> and there are certainly, certainly is value. I, I think we do need a place alone with God. We have a lot of examples in Scripture of people, men and women, that that did that at various places. Isaac went out into the field to meditate when he was waiting on a wife. Christ went up into the mountain. One place it says he rose up a great while before day and went out into a solitary place and prayed. Peter went up into the housetop. I don't know where your solitary place is, maybe in your bedroom or your office or Maybe even in the chicken house or the hay mow or somewhere like that. But I think we do need that solitary place. And then wherever it is, we need to make sure that the door is shut to the best of our ability. <clears throat> and I, I, I find that, uh, yeah, sometimes it, it does seem like, uh, am, I, am I really getting through to God? Or In fact, sometimes I, I don't feel like praying. <laughs> do you ever feel that way? You come to your prayer time and you just don't feel like praying? And then what should you do? Pray anyway. Pray anyway, yeah. In fact, I think it's all right to tell God you don't feel like praying. <laughs> and just tell him how you feel. And before you know it, you'll be praying. That's how I find it. Yeah. Go ahead. Sing. 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 Sing, yeah, that's a good, good idea. Yeah. You know, same praying anyway. I, I remember different times in devotions. I'm just cranking up tight. Tim had, had taught me this, and he said, Dad, song. What well, he meant is it's now time to have our devotions and sing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like it. And mm -hmm. he says, Dad, song. Mm -hmm. And I remember singing anyhow. Mm -hmm. And when I started singing, it maybe would took one or two songs, but something released. Mm -hmm. Yeah, appreciate that.
Right. We do that with anything else in our life that's important. Mm-hmm. We set time for it. Mm-hmm. We schedule it. That's also mm-hmm. a, I think, an important part of prayer. And I think it, it's okay if we don't feel like praying to tell God and ask him to help us to pray. You know, the disciples said, teach, teach us to pray. Daniel was, had an appointment three times a day. Right. I think mm-hmm. it was consistent. Yeah. Okay, I think I'll move on to one more point I have under this. Uh, you, maybe you heard me say this before. I think I got this from John Koblenz. He said that there's just two requirements, really, to be able to pray. Helplessness and faith. To really get through to God and have a meaningful prayer life, you're going to have to feel that you need God. You need his help. And if you don't, I, I don't know what the answer is, except the Spirit of God needs to work in your heart and help you to see how much you need him. And then faith. <clears throat> Someone said, helplessness becomes prayer the moment you go to Jesus and speak confidently with him about your needs. And we know what James says about asking for wisdom. Let him ask in faith, he says. D.L. Moody once said, uh, he said this way, I used to close my Bible and pray for more faith. And then I read in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now I still pray for more faith, but I do it with an open Bible. So I think there's something about feeding on God's word and fellowshipping with him that strengthens our faith. So as we come to God, seeing our need and believing that he can meet our need, we can get through to him. Do you have anything more on on that? Wrong motives for prayer. What did Jesus say here about that? What, was, what did he say about the Pharisees? What was their motive for praying? Be seen of men. Be seen of men, yeah. We may think sometimes that the temptations are out there in the world. When we're out there brushing shoulders with Worldly people is when we're going to be tempted, and that's probably true, but Satan will follow us right into our prayer life. Satan, I believe he will do anything he can to hinder us from praying, because he knows how vital that is for us to be thriving spiritually. And he will do anything, he will follow us right into our prayer closet. To be seen of men. Well, yeah, the Pharisees, he said, they have their reward. They probably got some praise for men. Somewhere Jesus said about the Pharisees, they, how was it? They, he said, this people draw near to me with their lips, draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So if we want a meaningful prayer, our heart has to be in it, right? <clears throat> I think this, and, and we find this here, in almsgiving, prayer, fasting, each of these, it's that problem of wanting people to know about it. It, it really strikes to the very core of our carnal nature, doesn't it? A problem we probably all have of wanting people to know how good we are. Well, is it wrong then to pray out in the street? So growing up Amish, yes. Right. Uh, I think we realize in our background they would frown upon audible prayer in public, probably taking it from here. We do find a number of times in the Bible, though, don't we, where Jesus prayed and others heard. Other people prayed publicly. Uh, When Peter was in prison, the church was gathered together praying. So I I think public prayer, 
prayer meetings, whatever, is biblical. I think, however, public prayer uh, or to lead, in, to lead in prayer in public, how do you find that? It has some challenges, I think. It, uh, it's pretty much of a temptation to try to make it sound good, isn't it? Uh, I think to be authentic and to not be hypocritical in our, when we do pray publicly is some issues we need to deal with. Someone said, just pray to God. Don't, don't pray uh, to impress people. And don't pray to teach either. <laughs> I've heard some prayers already that where you kind of get the idea the person is sort of trying to tell you something while they're praying to God. Prayer is not meant for that. So yeah, uh, I think Jesus was not saying here it's wrong to pray in, in public. He was, he was talking about the attitude, the motive behind it. But I'm just kind of bringing this in uh, because, yeah, I think leading in prayer in public uh, it can be a challenge. To do it from the heart, not to impress people, not to teach, just pray from the heart to God. It's, it's, it's kind of a learning process, really. But don't use that as an excuse to not pray for someone when you're in public. Right. Mm -hmm. You're talking about praying specifically for yeah. a person. Yeah. A person right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't say, come with me in my closet. Right. Mm -hmm. Pray for where they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Any more thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I agree with that. I think. It's not, Jesus did that right here. This, mm -hmm. this prayer. Mm -hmm. It was probably well thought through. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, he was even teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is this, such a matter of praying with well rounded prayers that I think in public we do well to think about. Not mm -hmm. just cut them off short. We were just maybe about a year ago, maybe not going to be five to ten minutes long either, but mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with that, Floyd. Yeah, uh, you know, we have gotten away from using the prayer book. Uh, I think you can pray using the prayer book, but if we don't, maybe it would be better to, like you said, think it through what we're going to pray. Maybe that would be better than just a haphazard prayer, right? I think it's good sometimes. I, I do that sometimes. If I know I'm going to be leading in prayer, I think about some things I should pray about. <clears throat> when you talk about public prayer, even you just now, you were calling it leading in prayer. And I think if, if, you, if we have that mindset, and I'm, I'm standing up here and I'm praying in front of these people, and I want them to enter into prayer with me. Mm -hmm. I think that helps us to know how to pray. Mm -hmm. Because we're leading each other in prayer. So you are saying lead, leading in prayer is the right term you're saying? I'm saying that you use that term. Mm -hmm. And it's a good term. And I think if we understand that when you're praying in public, you're leading others in prayer, it helps you to pray in, in the right way. Right, yeah. It, it, the focus is not on you. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a scripture in Acts, and I often wonder just how it was. Where the the apostles there, it says they they lifted up their voice with one accord, and then it it says the prayer of what they prayed. I often wonder how that was. Was it one person 
saying the words and everybody else's heart was in it? Or were they all actually saying the same words? Uh, I don't have the answer, but uh, I think our, yeah, our public prayers should be something like that when we're praying in one accord, even though one person might be leading in prayer. Right? Uh, when's this break to be, Tim? All right, uh, we want to lift an offering, so we'll take a short break. No, don't go out, out unless you have to. <laughs> All right, I think we'll just continue right on because time's gonna run out here. I have a couple more wrong motives for prayer that I thought about. Uh, for selfish gain, I think we know the Bible says that uh, we ask, James said, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that ye may what? <coughs> Consume it upon your lusts. I think one, somewhere I picked up the word pleasures there instead of lusts. Consume it upon your pleasures. Uh, I understand there was once a book written called Prayer, Getting Things from God. Now, yes, prayer is that, uh, but I think that's a bit of a shallow way of thinking of prayer as simply just getting things from God. Uh, but I think we do need to be careful about uh, our reason for asking. Uh, of course, we don't always know if God wants to give us this or not. But uh, let's be careful we're not asking selfishly. The third one I have is uh, pride, and this ties in very closely with the first one. But let me ask, can we be praying all by ourselves and still be guilty of pride? Dave says yes. How? How? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we may be praying, and after a bit, Satan will flash his thought in our mind. You know, you're a good person for being praying like this. You probably never experienced this. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Satan, Satan will follow us right into our prayer closet, and he'll, we might even become proud of the fact that we're praying, for how long we're praying, and what we're praying. So I think we need to, if Satan brings that thought in our mind right there, we need to repent of it. There's an example of that in the scripture. Remember the Pharisee, mm -hmm. Republican Pharisee said, I thank you, God, that I'm not like his other man. Mm -hmm. He was praying with pride. All right. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you know God's will. You have some thoughts on that? To me it seems there are some things we can know is God's will. What the scripture says. But I think we know of people that are praying for healing for certain people. And they say, I know I know they're going to be healed. Is that what you're referring to, Matt? Or? To me, we need to be very careful with that. What, what do you think? And I, I, have, you know, I have seen, witnessed where people pray that way or say, that we know it's going to be healed. Well, then they pass away and they say, well, yes, 
he's healed now in heaven. But that's not really what they meant. <laughs> so yeah, I think we need to be careful that we don't, uh, that we're not demanding things of God or, you know, we're not in charge. <laughs> I think we need to approach God with very much that attitude. We're not in charge. We're not calling the shots. It's up to God. So when we pray, thy will be done, aren't we confessing that we don't know what that is? Mm-hmm. You know, no. No. Yeah, I think that's a, a prayer of submission to the will of God. And I don't know if we'll get to that or not, but uh, the prayer of submission is one of those types of prayer that I was thinking of talking about. It has been said that the prayer of submission is prayer at its highest level. We may think that if we ask something of God and get it, that you know, then we can really pray. We're... We really know how to pray if we ask something of God and he gives it to us. But that thought has been a a real challenge to me that the prayer of submission is prayer at its highest level. And that's what Jesus prayed in the garden, didn't he? Bible says somewhere, not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So let's be careful that we're not commending ourselves for how we pray. <clears throat> I'd like to look at uh, rewards for prayer <clears throat> because Jesus does address that here. He says, Your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. What, what do you think he meant? What are these rewards for prayer? <clears throat> Thank you, that's a good one. In fact, I have it here. (laughs) Yes, just to have a relationship with him is a reward, isn't it? Anything else? Well, I'll just move on to what I I have here. And actually, this is, uh, I think I just copied this from some of my notes uh, when I taught on prayer at CBS, so it's it's maybe not quite, uh, yeah, it's just part of an outline here. I, I was... I addressed it there as the effects of prayer on our lives. And as so as I was looking over my notes and thinking about the effect that prayer has on our life, and then thinking about, well, how are we rewarded? How does Christ reward us for prayer? It occurred to me, well, this is, this is probably how. <laughs> the way it affects our lives, that's the reward, at least some of it. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, peace. But prayer is a relationship. I have that here. A meaningful prayer life gives us a sense of God's presence. Isn't that true? And isn't that a reward? Isn't that wonderful to, to go through the day and just have a sense that God is with us? I think there's real value in beginning the day with prayer. And I'm not saying that you're special prayer time has to be in the morning but I think we should at least in some way meet God in the morning and uh, then throughout the day cultivate a consciousness of his presence through prayer and that that's a blessing that's a reward in itself just to be have that consciousness of God's presence and the next one is what you said Dave peace of heart and mind I have a couple verses here in the Old Testament God said, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, precious verses. Can someone quote those? I only have a part of them here. Be careful for nothing. Right. I think, I really think everybody should memorize those verses and apply them, think of them when you feel yourself becoming a bit anxious. This word careful actually means anxious, worrying, uptight. You said you get uptight sometimes. I think we all do sometimes. When we get anxious about something, this is the recipe for peace. This is how we can 
can unload those burdens and have peace. And that, that is a reward, isn't it, for prayer? If we have the peace, the peace of God ruling our hearts. Somebody wants, somebody saying something? I said the world's searching for that. Right. That, mm-hmm. that very peace. Right. Mm-hmm. Comfort and strength when facing trials. Uh, this verse in Luke, I think, uh, is speaking about Jesus in the garden. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. I have wondered if Jesus, his physical body, if he would have been able to take it. As he faced that cup of suffering and death for the sin of mankind. Could he have physically endured it if this angel had not come and strengthened him? But I think we can experience that too. We all know what it is to go through hard times, to feel the burdens upon us. And I, I wonder sometimes, how does a, a non-Christian, how do they handle the burdens of life? The, the tough situations that come along in life. You know, I thought of Nickel Mine school shooting, those parents, what they must have felt. But they forgave. How could they do it? And then you read of other situations similar where they'll bring a lawsuit. Yeah, prayer brings, when we unload our burdens, uh, prayer is sometimes referred to, or the, the phrase is used, to pour out our heart to God. Pour out our heart. It's like you carrying a bucket of something and you pour it out. It's heavy until you pour it out, then it's light, the burden is gone, right? And I think that it works that way with prayer. Guidance. Jesus continued all night in prayer. What, what, was the, what did he do the next day? Why was he continuing all night in prayer? He chose his 12 disciples. Yes. He, of, the, of his disciples that probably were listening to this sermon, he chose 12. He, even Jesus, the Son of God, saw a need of this special relationship with the Father, praying to him all night, it says, before he made this important decision. But I believe he had the assurance, I believe he made that, those choices then with peace, with the assurance that this was what the Father wanted. And that, that is a blessing, that is a reward for prayer. If we can... Uh, Pray, ask God for direction, and then as he gives direction, move ahead with the assurance. This is his plan for us. This is his will. That's, that's in itself is a reward. <clears throat> Help to avoid temptation. Jesus said to his disciples, pray that ye enter not into temptation. Spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Yeah, we face temptations daily. We need to cry out to God for help. Forgiveness of sin. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. What a blessing, a reward for praying the prayer of repentance. We probably know how it feels to feel that load of guilt on us. To know there's sin in our life. And then to pray the prayer of confession and prayer of repentance. And to feel that, that load go away and to feel that peace. Forgiveness of sin. What a, what a reward. <clears throat> I think it can even be uh, rewarding when we pray for others. Uh, Sam, you referred to that. Uh, and that can be done in a lot of ways. Uh, in the church setting or... Going, going to visit somebody, a widow or an older person or a sick person, I think it's a good practice to pray for them. And there's a certain reward in that. Just to, uh, to know you blessed the person, to know you were a blessing to them. There's something about that that is rewarding. Encouragement and joy when our prayers are answered. Yes, yeah, sometimes God does give us the things we ask for. And that brings uh, 
a sense of joy, a sense of blessing, does it not? When, when we see that God is pleased to give us what we ask for, what a reward that is. That also increases our faith. That's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. As we, as we and I think as we grow in our Christian lives, in our prayer life, we should probably be experiencing more answered prayers. Is that right? Maybe less of our prayers should be selfish and more of our prayers should be according to God's will. Something to think about anyway. And of course, thinking of these rewards, uh, remember in the previous chapter here, Jesus spoke about persecution, suffering for the cause of Christ, and then he said, uh, rejoice and be exceeding glad for what? Great is your reward in heaven. So yeah, I think there's a lot of rewards here already for prayer, but God only knows what rewards he still has in store for us if we're people of prayer. I think we have about six or seven minutes yet. I'm going to uh, just go through this last slide here. Prayer is, and I have about six things here that prayer is. Prayer is a refocuser. Do you find it that way? Sometimes there's some problem that comes along and that's about all we can think. Or maybe at the end of the day, our, our mind is just full of the happenings of the day and, and whatever. But as we come to God, somehow our, our focus gets changed. And that happens through reading God's word too. Our focus is no longer on our problems. When we come to God and pour out our heart to him, it, it refocuses, it resets our focus. Do you have any comments on that? <clears throat> or testimony, maybe. Prayer is a burden lifter. We already talked about that. We sing that song sometimes. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. A burden lifter. We feel burdened down. God invites us to come and pour out our heart to him. And there's something about that that lifts those burdens. It's not always the circumstances. Mostly, it's not that the circumstances change, right? Often our prayers don't change the circumstances, but they change us. Prayer really isn't about changing God. It's more about changing us. And so often I think when, I think when we bring, is that the bell? Okay. So I, I think it often works this way when, when we have burdens and we, we bring them to God, it may not change the circumstances, it may not take the problem away, but it certainly changes how we feel in our heart. Prayer is a trust builder. We know God is always faithful. God was completely trustworthy. But the problem is on our side sometimes. We need to learn to trust God. And trust is usually developed, isn't it? In our earthly, in our relationships with one another. Uh, okay, Dave's story this evening. That, that uh, storekeeper uh, learned to trust this boy, right? As he saw time and again that he was honest. Usually the, the longer we're with a person and, and uh, see their integrity and witness that, uh, the stronger our trust is in them. And I think that prayer works that way. As we, as we learn what it is to commune with God on a daily basis, continually, our trust in him is going to grow. Yeah, God is completely trustworthy. He doesn't change, but our faith, our trust in him grows as we communicate with him. <clears throat> faith is an attitude adjuster. <laughs> you ever have... An attitude problem. 
for someone, some person, maybe the church even, or your family, or your neighbor, or your boss. Do you ever take it to the Lord in prayer? The person might not change, the situation might not change, but you'll probably change, and your attitude will probably change. Prayer, I think, is an attitude changer, an attitude adjuster to, to line up our attitude with the will of God, with how God wants us to feel about things. <clears throat> Prayer is a developer of intimacy with God. And let me say again, I believe there are I call it dimensions of fellowship with God that I have not yet experienced, of sweet fellowship that is still available if I avail myself of it. It's not found by quickly going through your prayers. It's not found by uh, a formal prayer, by just praying because you know you ought to. It's found when you have a hunger for God and a hunger for fellowship with him and learn to communicate with him. That intimacy with him will develop. And really, I think it's a lifelong process. As long as we're in this life, we won't get finished getting closer to God. We, we sing that song sometimes, deeper, deeper yet I pray, higher every day. Or we sing the song, uh, higher ground. I want to reach higher ground. I think we'll be wanting, we should be wanting that as long as we're living. And I, I really believe in heaven. That, that fellowship will continue to grow and develop. How does it say he'll... The exceeding riches of his grace. I can't quite get that verse together. But it seems to me that in glory God is going to sh continue showing us more and more of his grace. And our, our intimacy with him will probably continue growing. All right, I think our time is almost up. The last one I have here is prayer is a joy filler and a blessing. If you aren't experiencing a meaningful prayer life, you really are missing something. And I say that not as one that feels that my prayer life is what it ought to be. But you really are missing something if you don't know what it is to get through to God and enjoy fellowship with him. It, the joy that that brings far surpasses the fun that this world has to offer. Okay, I think we'll close with that. Tomorrow evening, I'd like to uh, focus more on uh, hindrances to prayer and fasting, okay, helps in overcoming hindrances to prayer, including fasting. And you might want to think about uh, fasting. Uh, I'm going to be looking at a little more than just fasting from food, but what are some other things that we should maybe fast from